Good evening, everyone, or good morning, if you're joining us from another part of the world. I'm Jan Daly. I'm the Financial Times Arts Editor, talking to you from London. And I'm really delighted to be moderating the first of Tefav Online's excellent series of talks for this uh, uh, second online edition. Um, this evening, we've got a really fantastic panel um, to discuss and to debate one of the hot topics of today's art world. I'll introduce them one by one. So first of all, Charles Somers Smith is an art historian and a museum director. He has been, he has had a fantastic career. He has been the director of the National Gallery in London, the director of the National Portrait Gallery in London. He then um, moved into the commercial art world and was briefly a director of uh, Blaine Southern. He is an author, commentator, and all-round expert. His new book is called The Art Museum in Modern Times, and I hope he'll be telling us a good deal about that. And we're also delighted to be joined by Jean-Claude Gondour, who is one of the leading collectors in Europe today. His collection spans antiquities, Egyptian particularly antiquities, right up to post-war, includes clocks, furniture, and much more. He's assembled a collection so important that it needs an important home. And I hope he'll be talking to us about the search for this home, about what that means to him and about what that means to many collectors when they're thinking about um, their possessions and their legacy and what they wish to do with it. Then Georgina Adam, who I'm proud to call my colleague at the Financial Times, a wonderful writer, journalist, expert, on the art world. She also writes for the art newspaper, but we don't worry about that. Um, she is the author of now three fantastic books. The first was called Big Bucks, about the contemporary art world. The second called The Dark Side of the Boom, which um, lives up to its name. And the third, which is just out right now, is called The Rise and Rise of Private Museums. So really from Georgina's um, research, we thought that we would talk about this, which is one of the most significant issues now facing the contemporary world of art. I don't mean the world of contemporary art, I mean today's art world. Um, so we've called, our, we've called our talk, Public Spiritedness versus Private Passions, The Great Debate. And I hope you'll agree with me that this is a very important topic and I hope it's one that will resonate with many of you. So I'm going to kick right off by um, coming straight away to you, Georgina, to put it in context. Why did you choose this as one of the burning topics of today's art world? Why is the issue of private museums and the establishment of private museums so important? I think it's important because so many have been established this century. And I think what's important is that we have seen um, a shift from museums basically being publicly funded to collectors wanting to have their own space to show their collection. And what astonished me when I started researching the subject was that there are between 300 and 400 of them around the world from China to India to South Africa to Brazil. There's a wonderful place in Brazil called Inho Chim, which is an art park, but also shows artworks. So I was very curious. I'm always interested about the, the, the intersection between art and money. And this obviously translates as people with a great deal of money who've been able to constitute a collection, but who have decided not necessarily to leave it to their local museum when they pass away. So I was very interested in the legacy aspect of it. And I was very interested in the motivations of collectors who make that decision. And I'm really looking forward to listening to what Charles with his vast experience, much, much more than mine. And uh, Jean-Claude, who I have actually profiled in the pages of the Financial Times. And Jean-Claude is really a true collector. And sometimes 
collectors are collectors in name only, but that's not the case for him. So I'm really looking forward to listening to them and hearing what they have to say. The final thing is that I think there is, because I come from an art market background, there is at the moment a big problem is that uh, some collectors have got so much money that they can outbid public institutions. And I think this is causing a lot of tension. Public institutions and museums are under stress at the moment for lots of different reasons, for what they've collected, perhaps their lacks of diversity in some cases. Um, in fact, the whole definition of a museum is under, under question at the moment. Um, in addition, there's this, this aspect of being outbid. They're looking at falling endowments. So I think it's a really rich subject, and I think there's a lot. I'm really looking forward to hearing what your other two panelists have got to say. <laughs> well, it yeah. certainly is it certainly is a rich um, rich topic, but and also as you say, something that's changing with huge speed. I mean, in you know when when I was growing up, um, you know in in Europe we'd hardly heard of private museums. They yes, were rare. In America mm. is a different matter, of course, mm. because that's always had a different. Um, ethos in, in the way in which um, art is shown to the public, because I think what we should remember here is that we're not, what we're talking about here really is the, is the philanthropic impulse of collectors to show their work to other people. We're not talking about collectors who just want to sort of keep all their stuff at home and that's absolutely mm. lovely, or in storage or wherever they keep it. We're talking about um, people who are mass important collectors and have a generous spirit and wish it to be shared, wish it to be shown, often have a strong educational um, impulse as well. So it is really all about how privately held works get seen by the public. I think, I think that's right. Is, it, is, it, is that right, Jean-Claude? Is that what you would say as a collector? And it's, as you said, it's a very vast problem uh, for me uh, in particular. Uh, the collection is big, as you said, it is about 3,500 different artifacts in various departments. And I, have, I had to make a choice one day, either to go to a museum, because you have three models. It's not only two, you have three models. One is your private museum, one is the public museum. And the third one is a joint venture between you and a public museum. I think it's very important to keep in mind that it's not yes or no. You can also have a kind of mixture. Now, I would like to add that America and Europe cannot be compared at all. It's two different worlds. Uh, in the United States, people are very free in building whatever they wish, wherever they wish. In Europe, uh, especially in the country where I'm a citizen, Switzerland, the, the land is very small, very reduced, i.e. to find a proper place to open a new museum becomes more and more difficult. Therefore, probably I will have to expatriate if finally I take the decision that to build a museum is the answer to uh, my needs. I'm not totally convinced. I'm not totally convinced. Uh, you have pros and you have contrasts for that. The pros are you have your liberty. It's your collection. You design your museum the way you wish to have it. Uh, you put whatever you wish in it and you organize your programs, your exhibitions, et cetera, et cetera. However, now the, the very contra it's like buying a Ferrari. You have the money in the bank, you buy your Ferrari, you, you put it in a garage, and you know how much it did cost. But you have forgotten that every year you, ha you will have to maintain your Ferrari. A museum is exactly the same thing with much larger numbers. <laughs> a good museum is a huge amount of money. Therefore, the endowment that you leave behind you has to be con uh, consistent and big enough to make sure that over time, your museum is not going to disappear. Thirdly, too many museums has been built recently, much too much. And 
few of them are outstanding, not only the shape of the museum, not only the uh, architect who has been doing the job, but also what is in the museum. But a number of museums will collapse because the quality of what is shown is not good enough to pull people into it. We need, we need to be very uh, humble. Our eyes is the eyes of Chimen, as the, as the French will say. And we always believe that what we have collected is the best of the best. If you don't have someone from the outside who give you the reality of what you have collected, who can say with consistency that what you have is really the state of the art, then go maybe for a museum. But you have to go through this motion to make sure that what you are going to uh, exhibit has a real value for the history of art and not only for your own pleasure. Otherwise it becomes what I call a mastaba. <laughs> mastaba being the, as you all know, the, uh, the tomb of uh, the old Egyptians. And I'm very afraid of that, that nobody pushes the door to enter and to see what you have uh, collected during your lifetime. And to end, I don't want to, to be too long. And to end, the reason also why I'm very skeptical in donations to museums, because over time I've noticed that you are dealing with a director who becomes your friend, who is ready to exhibit within the premises of the, the state museum, certain of your pieces, and you are delighted that your name is written here and there. And then 10 years later, you have a new director. He doesn't like what you have collected. And you discover that most of what you have given, offered to the museum disappears to the seller. And that's my worry with private collections, is that unfortunately, museums are rich, not with money, but rich with artifacts. And they will turn their collection in such a way that they, they do, each director will choose with his curators what kind of objects, what kind of paintings he wants to exhibit. So it's a big frustration also for a collector. <laughs> Yes, I understand that completely. So that's, that's a very strong motive for establishing your own space, isn't it? So that you can effectively control the way in which your objects are shown. I can completely see that. I expect that already many of our audience are um, itching to ask some questions of our panelists. And I should have said at the beginning that you can send in your questions through the chat function. Um, just write them down at any point during the, um, the talk and they will, they will come through to me and we'll leave a good 15 minutes at the end of our hour together to address your questions. So please send them in. And now, Charles, we'd love to hear from you. Um, Charles, you've directed one of the great museums of the world, the um, London's National Gallery. And... Um, of course, all the great museums of the world are made up in very large part of gifts from private collectors. Can you tell us something about um, the role, really, of that impetus, the private collector who then wants to donate to the nation or why, why that happens, how that happens, whether it's lessened over the years? Well, the example I was thinking of when Jean-Claude was talking about with the Mon family, who gave a big bequest to the National Gallery in from memory, although I wrote about it when I was in the National Gallery, it's a long time ago, in, in the 1920s. He was the person who set up Mon Chemicals, and then that became ICI in about 1927. And he was a big very, very significant collector with good advisors. 
and he decided to give his collection in a separate room. There is still a Mond room. But quite quickly, I, I have to be a bit careful what I say because it's still a highly contentious issue about the balance between private and public. So that in Britain, the balance has always tended to be towards the public, which is, I think, why uh, um, Charles Saatchi decided to set up a private institution in the 1980s rather than be subsumed within the tape. Although, of course, that itself has a complicated history. But, but the tradition was you gave to the National Gallery as the big public collection, and then things would become available to a big and broad public. But Mon wanted it to be kept discreet. And in the 30s, Kenneth Clark took the decision, interestingly, because he himself was a private collector, and he certainly was very sympathetic to private collectors, but he still essentially amalgamated the collection in the totality of the gallery as a whole. So that when I arrived, there were still descendants from the Mon family who were somewhere between upset that the legacy was not intact in the way it had been originally, um, to being on the verge of litigious that the terms of the gift had been breached. Mm -hmm. um, so that I was actually very, very startled um, by the fact that Georgina quotes Mark Jones, the former director of the V&A, who previously worked for a long time at the British Museum. And he basically is quoted as saying, and I hope and assume that Georgina checked the exact wording of what he said, was that over time, I can't remember that whether he applies only in British museums or in museums generally. I mean, it wouldn't be true to the same extent in the Metropolitan Museum, but even in the Met, over time, private collections get subsumed. And I think people forget the integrity of the original private collection. So if you are like Jean-Claude, making a decision between either giving it to a museum the Museum of Geneva, or half giving it to the Museum of Geneva, i.e. it's alongside, but in some way separate from the Museum of Geneva, or building your own museum. If you're absolutely intent on protecting your name in perpetuity, probably the third is the best way of doing it. But it has the risk, which Jean-Claude applies correctly, that over time, because it's not mainstream directors change, the mission changes. I mean, that, that's my sense of, I hope I've represented your views correctly, Jean-Claude. Absolutely. You know that I had uh, an experience with the Museum of Geneva. Uh, we signed a convention in 2010, and uh, it was linked to an obligation for the museum to refurbish it and to uh, make it bigger, to find space for part of my collections and keep a kind of autonomy inside the museum. Unfortunately, the, the people of Geneva have refused, not my collections or the convention I've signed with the uh, museum, but I have refused that the museum is refurbished by Monsieur Jean Nouvel. Uh, for whatever reason, it's too complicated to explain that here. But automatically, the convention sign collapsed because there is no space, more space in the museum today to uh, add a new collection or to give is, uh, enough space to a collection to uh, survive amongst the other objects belonging to the museum. So today I'm working on maybe finding a museum in another country, not to hide the name, it's France probably, uh, where we would build ourselves. I mean, my foundation would build a new section with 
the money of the foundation and not with the money of the state. Therefore, the autonomy may be much larger. And I can have my own curators. I, have, I can have my own director. And we can share a number of expenses, uh, which are especially on uh, cleaning, uh, security, uh, ticketing, etc., which are quite expensive and that you can share with the museum. And then it became, uh, on the long term, a good uh, solution. And in case my endowment is not enough, whatever it is today, you know how the world changes. Uh, at least you are protected in a way. A museum will never let down a collection which is attracting people. So that's why I like this mixture. I think, I think it's a wise way uh, in, uh, in giving a room and a roof to a collection. People will go to the state museum and next door they have a new uh, aisle they can go in with different exhibitions, with different style of, of artifacts. You know, very few museums in Europe have very large antiquities collections, apart the very big. I mean, you have four or five archi big, and then you have few museums in France, in England, here and there, who has nice pieces, but in a very small quantity. So, and it's very curious. Museums are much more interested in my antiquity collection than paintings, which has been rated by uh, the, the uh, director of Beaubourg as probably the best after war collections after Tate and Beaubourg in private hands. So I'm surprised, but- Is that because, because it's so hard for them to acquire antiquities now because of the constraints um, around, I mean, the ethical constraints, so that they're interested in being able to acquire a collection which already exists in depth. I, be, I think you're right. I yeah. think this is certainly mm -hmm. one of the motto. Uh, the, uh, the, even for me today, if I buy 10 pieces per year, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Mm -hmm. And it takes so long to go through the diligence to make sure that the documents which are provided are genuine and not fakes. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I can tell you that I, uh, one day I was confronted with a very nice pieces with a very good uh, provenance of which a document from a notary in, uh, in South France during an estate. So it was stamped by the notary with, uh, with all the names. And then because I'm, a, I'm curious, I started to look if I can find anything about this notary. <laughs> I couldn't find anything <laughs> on internet. So I went to the mayor of the town and I said, do you have a register of, uh, because as you know, uh, notaries have to re be registered uh, officially. And we couldn't find any trace. It was a fake, <laughs> an absolute yeah. fake. That, that, that's, that's fascinating. So you can, have, you can have a genuine artifact with fake, fake documentation. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The Georgina, I know you wanted to come in here. Oh, yes. I did just want to say to, Char to, to reassure Charles that I did check that quote about not giving you know, with, with Mark Jones. I did want to just say he definitely said it. That is not fake news. He definitely said it. <laughs> he's, of course, no longer in the business of having to attract private donors. So he's, he's able to say what he thinks independently of the consequences. But I'm uh, very Georgina is very reliable with her sources. <laughs> but, but, but Georgina, tell us tell us a little more about um, what both Charles and um, Jean Claude have said about this business of the the great urge of collectors being to keep the work, keep the integrity of the collection, keep the personality of the collection, and the name of the collector intact. Is that something that you've? I mean, you've now. Um, uh, interviewed dozens, if not hundreds, of um, of 
people who have set up private museums across the world. Is that, is that the most common um, urge that, that um, you find? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that uh, Jean-Claude absolutely hit the nail on the head. Is It's a question of control. There's a, ter there's a terror that the collection won't be kept together, that it'll gradually disappear. Exactly what Jean-Claude said. And this is why they, they set up their own museums, because they want to keep control of the way it's presented. And of course, the interesting question is the Barnes Foundation in America, where the founder had very precise ideas, but the trouble was that was sustaining it financially. And in fact, there again, I was very, uh, I uh, was very impressed when I spoke with Jean-Claude because he said to me in the interview that we did together, he said to me, I didn't spend, I can't remember how many years, 40 years building up a collection to see it dispersed when I, Pass and he has set up a whole structure so that the so that his collection can continue, the foundation can continue. And I think that is a really interesting aspect, the legacy aspect of, um, of private collections. The, uh, Eli Broad, who died recently and who spent an enormous amount of money on the Broad in Los Angeles, and he left an endowment of $200 million, which is wonderful. But that collection has got works by, for example, Damien Hurst, uh, not Damien Hurst, I was thinking um, of Jeff Koons. And you could, you could spend the whole endowment in one go on a Koons these days. So I think this is really something that's really problematic for, um, for collectors who would like to establish their own museum is how can, how can they really sustain it long term in the future? Um, they have to think of a way of making it it pay in some way, because exactly as Jean-Claude said, you can't know what's going to happen after you've gone. Things can change enormously. Well, I what, suppose what? That, that this, this idea of the third way, which is exactly mm. what Jean-Claude has, has described is, is, is very, very important. Charles, we don't really have that in Britain, do we? I mean, it, it, is there any, is there any institution here where, I mean, I think, um, is it fair to say that Britain is quite behind um, many other um, countries in Europe and certainly in America in the establishment of private museums? We just don't re really have that many yet. Not, well, well the Sainsbury Collection in the University of East Anglia is, I think, a good instance. And I wasn't familiar with the story behind it. One of the things I enjoyed about doing the book was that it gave me an opportunity and necessity of learning more about the background of the museum. So the Sainsbury family, uh, Bob and Lisa Sainsbury, offered the collection, which I don't think is generally known, first of all, to the Fitzwilliam. And the Fitzwilliam said, great, we love all the paintings, but we don't like all this ethnographic stuff. So that if you give it to us, we'll give the ethnographic stuff to the Museum of Anthropology, the Museum of Archaeology. And they said, no, the whole point of it, the whole point of the collection is the integrity of it. It's our view and included, of course, ceramics. And so that's what led them to um, give it to the University of East Anglia. They, they made friends with the vice chancellor and the building, the, the campus was just being developed by Dennis Lesden. And then, and then they were incredibly adventurous in commissioning Norman Foster. It was very early in his career. And unfortunately, it's a good instance of very determined, thoughtful, serious collectors who come up against bureaucracies who don't want to adapt their systems in the interests of the donor. I mean, it's interesting to think, um, I mean, I was trying to think, Jupiter Artland is obviously a good model of a, a private collection um, close to Edinburgh so that it benefits from, I assume, quite a lot of synergy with the public collections, but it's still independent. And, and then um, there's a, a private museum being done in Bath, isn't there? But, but it's not yes. as common in this country. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but I mean, we, we've, we've got effectively a handful compared to dozens and dozens, let's say, in, in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, Let's turn to another aspect now of, of um, the whole question of a museum mm -hmm. and what, what we 
Because really what it brings up is not just the, the, um, the, the collecting life of an individual, but it also brings up the whole kind of point of showing art to the public. I mean, what, you know, what are we doing with this? What is a museum for? What do, we, what do we want? It's not just to go and look at pretty things, although that's a very, very important thing. I mean, it is all about um, continuous, continuation of tradition and education is a very essential aspect, I think, particularly of, of, of today's museums, all of whom I think have, feel that they have this very powerful um, mission about um, an, 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 a, a real educational aim and that that's very much part of it. And to, to answer the, the public spiritedness part of our, of our title, which by the way, Georgina came up with, um, <laughs> um, let's, let's talk a little bit about whether um, and how private museums can meet this function in a way that um, we can see how bigger museums can do this, but how national museums can do it. Um, so um, can I come back to you, Jean-Claude? Do you feel that um, the, the idea of, of showing your work to the public in order to, to, to educate them culturally is an important part of what you wish to do? It is I mean, essential. You can, you, can, you can say no, if you like. No, it <laughs> is, no, 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 it is essential. It is essential. I mean, the, to share, I mean, it's a mission of the foundation, to share art to share what is uh, what is uh, beautiful but for this you have to put programs uh, in motion you cannot just decide from the day one uh, that you are going to put artifacts one next to the other and that people will come a million of people will push the door to come and see it if you, and you are really in the core of the of the story i would say uh, today a museum is more than just a house for objects. A museum has to be has to be a, a place of life where uh, people are happily pushing the door to see something. I, I, my idea is that people maybe should not push the door to look at your collection first, but for what kind of new exhibition or kind of uh, happening you are putting together. For example, I believe that a museum today could easily invite a number of uh, artists to work in the museum for a while and show to the public of this museum how they work, discuss with the public and make interactions between the, the real life and the museum life. So for me, this is something very important. Secondly, Education, education, How, what is the percentage of people in the world going in a museum? 1%? It would be wonderful. So it's a very small number of people. How to make it 2%? No, this no, is... in the United Kingdom, yes. something like 48% of the population is going to goes to something resembling a museum every year. So it's not quite such a minority pursuit. I, I mean, I, no, I don't know I said the, in the world. statistic. <laughs> yes, I no, in the no, world. but uh, <laughs> I mean, um, I, what you're talking about, I assume, is people who go regularly in a committed way to museums out of a spirit of passionate dedication. That could be 2%. But if you include tourists, I think it, it used to be said, maybe only by the museum community, that more people went to museums than went to football matches. It was one of those <laughs> mantra as a way of trying to demonstrate that they were not such a small scale and elitist activity as some, some people sometimes think they are. Well, in, well, in Britain, school, school children are forced to go to museums, whether they like it or not. <laughs> exactly. That's what I <laughs> wanted to say. There. Probably your 48 percent, more than half, are children coming with the school. And yeah. probably for I think, most I of think them, they probably are. it may they be are. the only time in their life where they will be uh, going into a museum. I will give you an example. I will give you an example which is uh, self-explanatory. 
my foundation is uh, financing uh, mediation in a, in a museum in Paris, which uh, you know, which is Cluny, Musée de Cluny. And uh, I, because I love, as you know, uh, Georgina, I love uh, Middle Age. So we have um, built a, a model of mediation for children, but children which are coming from what we call difficult quarters of uh, Paris, the north of Paris. And when we opened uh, the show, I was attending it and I played with the children. And one of them came to me and said, you know, sir, it's first time that I come in Paris, not in the museum, in Paris. <clears throat> and he's living nine kilometers from the center. So I have also to live with the reality. Uh, you have people who have an education because the parents have received an education and you have people coming from the immigration and they have different habits and we have to help these people to join us in looking out in our art the same way we have to look at their art. So all those things are very important in the philosophy that you have to put together if you want your museum to be what I call the house of life. Hmm. Plus, you have to invite them. And before inviting them in the museum, you need to have a nice garden. You need to have a space outside, which is appealing, where people do want to come on the weekend, you know, uh, to have even a barbecue, who cares? I said one day to the mayor of a town, he said, how are you going to attract people? And I said, look, sir, if I need to, to sell hot dogs and kebab, I will do it. <laughs> For me, what is important is that people come. And if they enjoy the place, they may push the door and look what is inside. You know, it, it's something which will take time. And, and we have really to, uh, uh, to make the effort to put money on the education and to help the children to understand that art is something very important. Hmm. Um, yes, Georgina. Can, I just wanted to say that in, the, in this discussion, I think we also really should look at what's happening in countries that absolutely don't have contemporary art museums. And I'm thinking of somewhere like India. And it's thanks to private collectors that uh, who put their exhibition, who put their works of art, their collections on show, that uh, they're able to support their own artists for a start. There's no platform for them, or contemporary art even in, um, in Italy. There are masses of wonderful museums in Italy, but not for contemporary art. And it's people like um, Patrizia Sandretto, you know, who established a museum. So I think that we need to look beyond our established places where museums are and see what they're doing in places like South Africa, India, China, um, other countries where there's just not the structure and they really do have an important educational role and they'd have children in and so on. So in, in, in such places, there really isn't a choice either for collectors, is there? The, the choice we're talking about, about whether you, whether you might give your work to a state museum or, or to a large public institution, because that doesn't exist. Um, or it, they have, there is, there may be one, I can't remember exactly the country, but somewhere in Southeast Asia, and the, and the collector said to me, if I gave it to a, to a state museum, the conditions of conservation are catastrophic. It won't, they won't be looked after. And they might even sort of disappear. So it's 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 another element as well. You mm. you you safeguard your collection by having your own museum in some countries. Yes. So I'd be you... sorry. I'd be really interested to hear Georgina's views of the private museums in Shanghai, because in a way, Shanghai is a place which has gone to the other end of the spectrum, where the public city is in, actually encouraging and essentially subsidizing private collectors to come in and establish their own museum. So far from it being a public oriented pub, set of public institutions, it's a public city supporting and endorsing private collectors coming in. 
Yes, I mean, not just Shanghai, also in Beijing. And it's, yeah. it's quite complicated. It's part of the, this Chinese desire to catch up with the West. And they had, I think it was in 2012, they had this plan that they wanted to increase the, the number of museums per capita. And obviously per capita in, in China is, is an awful lot of people. So you need a lot. And I think that they felt that by encouraging private collectors to create their own museums, um, that they would increase the number of museums, they would achieve, they would acquire collections or they would acquire collections put into private museums uh, by giving away the land generally more or less for free or giving very, very um, uh, good rates for, for, for establishing them. Um, there is, of course, a big link with real estate in China. It really is a very different um, scene going on there. And a lot of real estate uh, promoters will add a museum in to their real estate development because they get extra zoning um, uh, facilities, they're perhaps able to build a bit more. And in some cases, those museums become what a Chinese uh, museum director told me were mosquito museums, i.e. they're only inhabited by mosquitoes once the real estate project has been realized and there actually isn't a real collection. So I think Shanghai, which has seen an enormous boom in the number of, um, of museums, goes from wonderful ones like the Rockbund, which I'm sure you've seen, to, to other ones that really, quite frankly, are, are, are not worthy. Um, perhaps in future, they can build up those collections gradually, but very often the Chinese collectors, they just haven't got the depth, really. You know, they've got a few prize objects, but it's going to take them a while before they can produce a really good collection with consistency. That's that's very that's very interesting. So it, it is I think I think what we're hearing, I mean, we already all said to each other, didn't we, at the beginning that we can't really compare the American scene with the European scene. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, across the world those differences become even more intense, really, don't they? Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. it becomes, becomes more complicated to, to make these, um, these, uh, these distinctions. Well, look, we've got some great questions coming in. So just, perhaps, just, um, just, uh, just before we, sorry, we go yes. to the question, there is one, uh, we have to warn also the European uh, collectors that contrary to the United States, the public doesn't, uh, give much money to mm. private museums. It's not, it's not the habit in Europe, in no countries I know, where you can say that you have a group of people who are ready to give money every year to make sure that the museum will grow, that uh, you can continue to buy. And also, uh, it is essential, I think, people must understand that money is good to maintain a museum, to make it work. But if you want your museum to grow, you need to have big supports. Uh, if you don't grow a collection after you, and you don't give the authorization to uh, your, uh, your heirs, your museum will become, uh, as I call it, a mastaba. You mm -hmm. know, uh, you, you really need to show that things are moving. Mm -hmm. the, the, the state museum are more like uh, the National Gallery, for example, is, is one period of the history. But if they find something important on the market, they find the money to buy it. Yes. You as a private, you will not. Can I just say, though, that you do have, for example, we have Sir John Soane's Museum here, which is a capsule of a collector's taste, and that works. So sometimes you can have a collection that is so good and so interesting that it's well, it now it has been given to the state, but it was originally a private museum. So I think a lot depends, as you said at the beginning, on the quality of the collection. Yeah, sure. Yes, and, and also since that one's in, in its original place, in its original house, yes. there, isn't, there isn't an inch in which to put anything more. Yes. <laughs> and the success and of your model, and the yes. success of your model. Yes. Because you will be supported by the town where you are if you bring new people to the town as tourists. Yeah. Because you cannot survive. Is, is, is Isabella Stewart Gardner is a version of the same because Isabella Stewart Gardner 
has the same restrictions on growth. It has added a wing, but what people go for is the sense of a display which remains intact and mm -hmm. is very atmospheric. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. Um, now then, um, one, I'm going to take the first question, and this is for uh, Jean-Claude. It says, Monsieur Gondor, what was the moment in your life when you decided to start making plans to share your collection with the public? It's oh, a nice question. It's a very nice yeah. question because I think this this is the moment at which you you perhaps realised that you were, you know, you 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 were doing something more than than yeah. just making something for your own delight. Be, believe it or not, I, I never gave much importance to my collections until two thousand and one, when by uh, almost accident, uh, I invited a curator to come to my house to translate uh, uh, hieroglyphs. Mm -hmm. And uh, he saw my collection and said, why we don't do an exhibition? And I, I told him, look, I don't think it's that important as a collection to be exhibited. I don't see uh, what is special. They can go to the Louvre, to the, to the British Museum. I mean, uh, people can see uh, the same things. He said, yeah, exactly. They can see the same thing. That means your collection is of the quality of those museums and we want to exhibit it. I said, okay, but there is one condition is that my name never appear during the exhibition because I don't want that in the papers, I read that uh, it's rubbish, okay? <laughs> and when I saw the result and how a curator is able to put together what you believe to be only objects, but suddenly starts telling a story to the other people. I said, this collection doesn't belong to me anymore. It has been in a, in a book, people have bought the book, therefore I have already lost part of it morally, is not anymore mine. And mm -hmm. from that day, that day, so 2001, I decided that it has to be put at the disposal of the people, which I do not through a museum today, but we learned about, we have learned in 10 years, believe it or not, 1,400 different artifacts and paintings wow. from the collection to That's about amazing. 65 museums in the world, mm -hmm. of which the largest, Tate, Beaubourg, Met, uh, Getty, Jap in Japan, in China. So it's a mission, it's a mission now. This collection, I'm just a curator. I'm the director curator. That's it. Uh, but, but, but also you're still acquiring, so that's very important. Um, well, that, that's a, a, an astonishing figure and, and we, we salute you. I mean, it is really wonderful. Don't tell it too much to the Tefaf uh, dealers because <laughs> or be after me next week. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes, very much so. Um, the next question is for Charles. Um, so it says, Charles, while working for a public institution, did you ever decline gifts from private collections? And if so, what were the reasons? Hmm. It's a good question. When I was at the National Portrait Gallery, we acquired, in retrospect, voraciously, <laughs> because portraits weren't very expensive. We were a tiny bit wary of people who wanted to present portraits of themselves. And we were, <laughs> it only yes. happened very occasionally. And luckily I am not going to remember who the people were. No, oddly, <laughs> enough, oddly enough, you can't remember anyone's name, can you? As it happens, as it happens. Strange I'm that. Erased. <laughs> Those Ooh. people who took me on one side mm -hmm. and made it clear to me that it was time their portraits appeared on the wall. <laughs> uh, so we, we, we were careful. And in that case, the trustees were actually incredibly valuable because the trustees would make a decision as to whether or not somebody was worth acquiring. And actually, I found that helpful because it gave a kind of authority behind the decision as to who was in and who was out. 
At the National Gallery, I would love to think we were offered things routinely. Uh, we were having to buy them at simply staggering expense. And I certainly don't remember, um, I don't remember tricky issues, and I definitely would, because I remember only too many tricky issues about big acquisitions, but they were big purchases. Mm -hmm. And they were about, they were negotiations on price, uh, where <laughs> broadly, much as the National Gallery likes to promote the philanthropic tradition from the 19th century of people giving work. Some people did, the Countess of Carlisle, and I think the Earl of Carlisle, things went from Castle Howard, but the majority were negotiated purchases. Um, and then the Royal Academy was not really an acquiring institution in the same way, it's not a museum in a conventional way. So, so I never had to face that issue. I mean, it, it, what probably lies behind the question and was something I was encouraged to deal with, actually by my editor, he said, you can't deliver this book without having something about what I've called the morality of wealth. That is the extent to which it's legitimate to have trustees and sponsorship and support from people who one now increasingly in a different moral environment from what we had in the past, people are very dubious about. And, and that I do deal with. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Well, unfortunately our time is, is rapidly coming to an end, but we have one more question. Um, actually we have more than one, but here's one. Um, Mm, I think this maybe we've covered this. Um, so if you think we have, we'll move on. But the question is, the questioner asks, could you share your views on how private collectors showing individually at a major public museum might best achieve a cooperation, ensuring a collection's intrinsic content equals the commercial drive of such endeavors? Well, mm -hmm. Um, mm. perhaps, perhaps we have answered that question. Do you think we have? Mm. Well, the, the only thing I would say, we didn't quite cover the history of the Broad collection, where, of course, he is an example of somebody who wanted to give his collection to the Los Angeles County Museum, and indeed built a wing of the Los Angeles County Museum to contain it, and was himself very involved in the selection of its director and was a very active trustee and donor. And then, for whatever reason, <laughs> decided actually that he would build his own museum next door to the Disney Concert Hall. And, and that switch, I think, is very interesting if you're looking at the recent drive away from public institutions towards private museums. Yes, that, that's, that is interesting. And um, we've literally just got two and a half minutes, but um, this might be, be one worth answering. Going forward, would it help if public and private join forces in acquiring artworks together based on the wishes of the museum? Now, there was that very, there has been that very, very interesting project in Dallas where um, there's a public private um, acquiring partnership. I expect many of you know about this. Um, the Dallas Museum and two or three um, uh, very prominent collectors acquire works together um, that are destined, eventually destined for for the for the museum, which is a, a wonderful um, a wonderful uh, project. And I gather that it's worked very well, but it is quite unusual. Um, uh, Jean Claude, what, what's your feeling about that? Um, would you ever would you ever or have you ever been part of a, a kind of um, joint acquisition um, project? It was not a joint acquisition, but one day the Museum of Geneva has approached me uh, because they wanted to buy a Corot, a very important Corot of the period of the Italian period. And uh, they could not afford to pay the price. So uh, what we have done is, I, I said, okay, but I need to find another another uh, foundation who is ready to share the uh, the cost of the purchase uh, which we found and we bought the coro in an auction but because of the uh, 
the, the obligations of my foundation, we cannot give it as a gift. It has to remain the property of the foundation. So what we have done, what we have done is that, and I think it's an answer to other questions that I have and people may have, is I, I lent you the Koro as long as it is exhibited. <clears throat> If it's no more exhibited, we will put it in another museum. Sure. Well, that's so. That's, De that's Corot really... now for more than fifteen years is exhibited. Ah. <laughs> well, and my daughter-in-law is very careful because she's a lawyer, and she told me, "Believe me, after you, we will be looking that the Coro is still exhibited." <laughs> Otherwise, I think it has I'm to be so, shared. So, I'm so sorry. Day. I'm going to I'm going to have to stop us because I have very strict instructions, and we've got uh, only seconds left. I just wanted to take those seconds to thank you all so much for this fascinating discussion, for um, for um, sharing everything. I'm so sorry, my timer went off. Um, for, sharing, <laughs> for sharing all your thoughts, your expertise and your wisdom. Um, and to our audience, thank you for very, very interesting questions. Please enjoy TEFAF online and um, join me in thanking our wonderful panel. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you for inviting Thank me. You. Thank you, Jen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.